السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن شاء الله today we are going to continue uh, a little bit in the chapter of uh, solids a uh, few slides remained from the last lecture uh, and إن شاء الله we will uh, initiate another topic إن شاء الله which is the state convergence okay uh, you remember from the last lectures we uh, discussed the uh, the different cases of the uh, clauses backing structuring uh, the first one is the simple cubic like this structure uh, where eight atoms are located at the corner of a cube and if you remember from the last time uh, every atom at the corner of a cube participate by one over eight to that unit cell okay because every atom at the the corner here is actually participating in eight cubes in eight cubes okay however in the other structure here the body center the cubic we have eight atoms are located which are located at the corner of the cube but we still have another one which is located in the middle of the cube the same thing every atom at the corner participate by one eight in that unit cell but the one in the middle here is participating by one atom exactly one atom okay uh, the other structure, the third one, which is called uh, face center, the cubic or FCC or cubic closed backing CCB. We have eight atoms which are located at the corners of the cube, and six atoms are located at the faces of the same unit cell. Uh, the atoms which are located at the faces. Uh, participate by one half by 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 uh, by uh, one half uh, atom to uh, every face to the to that unit cell. Okay, so basically, how many atoms we we have here for all these structures per unit cell? Here we have eight atoms for the symbol cubic and everyone participate by one. So overall we have one atom per unit cell. We have one atom per unit cell. The other one here, we have eight atoms. Everyone participate by one over eight. Okay. So overall we have one atom, but we still have another one in the middle here. So overall we have two atoms in the body center cubic. The other one here, the third one, which is the face center of the cubic. Uh, the atoms in the corner participate by one overall, and uh, six atoms at the faces, everyone participate by one uh, half. So uh, overall, we have three atoms from the faces. So overall, three plus one equal to four. So we have four atoms per unit cell. This is for face center of the cubic. So wherever yeah, yeah, you see, in the first center of the cubic unit cell, you know that we have four atoms per unit cell. This is something that you need to uh, realize, okay? Okay, so, uh, so we know now about the participation or the contribution of the corner atoms. We know about the bulk atoms. We know about the face atoms. How about the ages? If some atom is located at the age, how, uh, what, what, how many cubes it might participate with another cube, another cube? For the edges, every atom at the edge, uh, at the edge uh, uh, coordinate or uh, share with four cubes, with four cubes. You can, you can imagine this if you uh, just arrange four cubes together, you will find uh, every edge is shared between four cubes, shared by four. So if atom is located at the, the edge of a cube, 
uh, it means that the participation of the atom for a single unit cell is one over four, is one over, over four, okay? So you need to uh, know about this, okay? Uh, how, uh, the net number for the fifth center of the cubic, as I said, here we have uh, eight atoms at the corner, and every one participate by one over eight, and we have also six atoms at the faces, Everyone participates by uh, uh, half uh, an atom for uh, each uh, unit cell. So overall, we have four atoms for face center the cubic. Uh, and this table is very important. We, uh, you see this uh, last time. This is the number of adjacent cells sharing the atom, number of adjacent cells sharing the atom. For the cube in the corner, the atom is shared between eight cubes. So the, the, the percent or the participation the, of the atom for a single cube is one over eight. For the atoms at the edge, it, shares, it is shared between four, four cubes. So the participation is one over four. For the face, it's shared between two, only two, okay? So the participation is half. The internal bulk is shared in only one uh, unit cell. So the fraction uh, of uh, that atom to the single unit cell is uh, one, okay? Uh, how about the net number of spheres in simple cubic? In simple cubic, as I said, we have eight atoms uh, at the corners. So overall, we have only one atom per unit cell. This is for simple uh, cubic. Uh, once I gave you the, the symbol unit cell, symbol uh, cubic, you know that the, the, the arrangements of atoms, okay? And the, the, the total uh, atom per unit cell is only one, is only one. This is uh, something uh, by default, you, you have to know it, okay? How about the BCC, the body center? Because once you, you know the, the, the name, I gave you the name BCC, so directly comes to your uh, attention that we have eight atoms at the corners and a single atom in the middle of the cube, okay? How about uh, uh, the number of atoms per unit cell? Two. Eight from the uh, eight atoms, everyone participate by one over eight. So overall, we have one atom at all the corners, but we still have one in the middle, so the total is, is two atoms, okay? So two atoms in uh, body-centered cubic. Uh, and this is a, a new topic uh, today, the density of a close back solid. If you want to calculate the density of a structure, uh, if I give you a piece of, uh, of uh, steel, for example, and I asked you to uh, calculate the density of that steel, uh, basically you can take that, uh, piece of uh, steel and you go to uh, balance and you take uh, you get the weight and then uh, by some means you can calculate the, the volume of that uh, piece of uh, steel uh, by displacement uh, of uh, water or any uh, any method you, you wish okay uh, you can calculate the, the volume or even you can make it by calculations and once you uh, divide the mass by uh, the, the, the volume, so this is the uh, density. So density is basically the mass per unit, per unit volume, okay? The mass per unit volume. How about the calculations of the uh, solid crystals? Solid crystals. Uh, of course, you can take the, 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 the whole piece of iron or you can even cut a small piece of that uh, steel, of the steel, and you calculate the density for this small piece. And of course, if the, 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 the whole sheet of steel is homogeneous, the same density for the small piece will apply to the whole piece, okay? So that's what we will do for the, 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 the whole crystal. If you want to uh, calculate the density of silver uh, sheet, for example, silver sheet, 
if you calculated the density of a single unit cell, a single unit cell, so this will be the same density for the silver sheet, okay? Easy? Is it easy? Okay, so we want now to calculate the density of a single unit cell of silver, okay? The same rules apply for the unit cell. If you want to calculate the density of a unit cell, you need to know the mass of atoms in the unit cell. You need to know the mass of atoms in the unit cell. This is number one. Number two, you want to calculate the volume of the unit cell, of a single unit cell. So you need to, to know the mass of a single unit cell based on the number of atoms uh, that uh, exist. Uh, and the second thing, you need to calculate the volume of the unit cell, okay? So this is a, uh, an exercise. Silver crystallize in a cubic close backing structure. The radius of a silver atom is 1.44 angstrom. Uh, calculate the density of a solid. Of course, you, you need to, to know the conversions from angstrom to centimeter to meter. This is something uh, you need to uh, realize perfectly, okay? So the, the question is very simple. It gives you only the size of the silver atom. The uh, radius, the radius of the silver atom, the radius of the silver atom. Uh, and from the radius, how can you calculate the, uh, the volume of the unit cell? And from uh, the uh, atomic mass of silver, atomic mass, you can calculate the mass of the unit cell. How many atoms are there in the face center of the cubic? How many atoms? We start in the last, sli in the last uh, slides, okay? Uh, how many atoms are there in face center of the cubic unit cell? How many atoms? Four, right? Four, right. For, for in the corner, we have eight. Everyone participate by one over eight. And in the faces, on the faces, we have six. Everyone participate by half. So overall, we have four atoms. Can you calculate the atomic mass uh, can, can you calculate the mass of the unit cell? We have four atoms, and of course, you know from the periodic table the mass of every single atom, of every single atom. You can know. So if you multiply the mass of every single atom by four, then you calculated the mass of the unit cell. This is number one, okay? How about the volume, the calculations of the volume? We will know now about the calculations of the volume. This is the shape of the unit cell of face center of the cubic. We have eight atoms at the corners and we have six atoms at the faces, okay? Here for the face center of the cubics, atoms are touching each other along the face diagonal, along the face diagonal, okay? So they are arranged in the way this is a feature for the face center of the cubic, that atoms are touching each other along the face diagonal, okay? So this is the face diagonal, and this is the each, each length, which is A, each length, okay? So uh, all the dimensions of the cube are, are the same, okay? A, 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 okay? And this is the, the face diagonal. How about the face diagonal, the, 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 the length of the face diagonal? Here we have R in the blue uh, atom, and this is also R, and this is 2R, the radius, where R is the radius of the atom. And the, he gives you the, the, the radius of the atom here. So overall, the face diagonal is basically 4R, it's 4R, okay? And this is a cube, uh, which means that the angle here is 90. 90 degree, okay? So how can you calculate the relationship between the radius and the edge of the cube? The edge of the cube. Of course, you can apply, you can apply uh, Pythagorean theorem, okay, to calculate the uh, relationship between R and A. This is like a triangle, okay? Uh, and uh, very simply, you, you know that 
4 uh, r square equal to a square plus a square, which is 2 a square. So you arrange this to finally know that a equal to r the uh, square root of 8. Okay, so this is a relationship that we need to know. Do you know r? The radius, he gave you he gave you the radius of the silver atom, okay? So now you can calculate very simply the cube edge. If you know the cube edge, can you calculate the, the volume of the cube? How can you calculate it? Is you apply the You apply what? Uh, actually, this is for the cube. The, 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 the volume of a cube equal to? Equal to a cube. A cube is the each, the each length cube. The each length cube, okay? So if you know a here, uh, which is a function of r, okay? So you can very simply calculate, calculate, the volume of the unit cell. The volume of a unit cell is basically a cube. So you substitute here uh, for uh, the value of uh, of r uh, square root of eight, and you end up with the volume of the unit cell. So this is the first part of the calculation of the density: is to know the volume of a unit cell, and then we need to know. The mass of the unit cell. How many atoms exist in the first center of the cubic structure? How many atoms in the unit cell? Four atoms, as I said. Okay? Okay, so we have four atoms occupying this volume that you calculated. Okay? And the atomic mass of silver is 107.9 gram per mole. Gram, you, you should realize also the unit, gram per but we are not uh, talking about uh, a mole. The mole is containing Avogadro's number of atoms. We need to calculate only the mass of a single atom. A single atom, and then you calculate the mass of four atoms, okay? So to, uh, to get the, the, the mass of a single atom, you need to uh, divide here by the Avogadro's number. Then this is the... Uh, uh, the, the mass of a single atom, the mass of a single, but we, we have in the first center cubic structure, unit cell, we have four atoms, so you, can, you, so you, you multiply this by four, so this is the overall mass of the unit cell, which is 71.7 .7 times 10 to the power of minus 23, okay, gram. Uh, and finally, you calculate the density, which is mass over volume, so this is the density of uh, a silver unit cell, uh, 10.6 gram per uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, this is the same density for a silver sheet, okay? Because as I, as I said, we assume that the, the, the sheet is homogeneous. So once you calculate uh, the density of a single unit cell, this applies to the whole sheet of, of silver. Okay, so generally, when you calculate the density, you need to apply this formula, Z over A cube, uh, Z uh, times uh, capital M over A cube times uh, Avogadro's number. This summarizes the whole process that we have, we have done, okay? Where Z is the number of atoms per unit cell. This is the number of atoms per unit cell. Uh, and A is the edge length. Uh, and the capital M is the molar mass uh, or the atomic mass of the material, uh, and Na is uh, Avogadro's number. And of course, uh, Z has the value of one for simple cubic, two for BCC, and the four for uh, face center cubic. Uh, if you apply this, you will get some relationships between uh, the radius of the atoms and the edge uh, length of a single cube. This is for simple cubic r equal to a over two, and I encourage you to uh, to uh, to derive this uh, relationship at at home. For BCC, r equal to a uh, the square root of three uh, over four, and the four face center of the cubic. This is the relationships that we have derived uh, right now. Okay, so usually. 
for uh, we have two different diagonals for a cube. One is called the phase diagonal, and along this phase diagonal, atoms are touching each other for phase centered cubic structure. For phase centered cubic structure, we have also another one which is the body diagonal. Body diagonal. This one here from this uh, edge, from this uh, corner to this uh, to the, the the other corner from the other side. Okay, this is called the body diagonal. And for body center, the cubic atoms are touching each other along the body diagonal, not the face diagonal, not the, the face diagonal. Okay, so uh, we uh, uh, and this is the origin of the difference between the uh, different backings in uh, uh, body center, the cubic, and the face center, the face center cubic. Okay, for the body diagonal. You can, of course, if you want to make the, the, the calculation like uh, Pythagorean uh, theorem, uh, you can uh, do the same, but in that case, you need to uh, take this, uh, this uh, side, which has, uh, which has the, the, the cube uh, each length, okay? But you need to use the phase diagonal in the triangle. Okay, you, you have to, to, to use the phase diagonal. And of course, you can calculate the, the length of the, uh, this phase diagonal from the uh, another, uh, another uh, triangle here that we have calculated for phase uh, center uh, cubic uh, crystal lattice. Okay, so uh, I think maybe we will have uh, another example for this. Uh, but the, the body uh, diagonal here is square equal to the face diagonal square plus a square. Okay. Uh, okay. If atoms touch each other along the body diagonal, thus the body diagonal has a length that is four times the radius of the of the atom. Okay. Also, if the atoms are touching each other, as, a, as we, we, we did in the face center of the cubic, if atoms are touching each other along the face diagonal, so the face diagonal, the length of the face diagonal will equal to 4R. The same apply here. If atoms are touching each other along the body diagonal, then the length of the body diagonal equal also 4R, equal 4R. And you can continue in the calculations here for the body diagonal. Similarly to what we did for the phase diagonal to end up with the relationship between the each length of the cube and the, uh, the radius of the, of the atom, okay? Backing fraction for a BCC uh, back distortion. Backing fraction, what, what, what does it mean, the, the, the backing fraction? You know, in, uh, for the body center, the cubic, how many atoms we have? We have two atoms for the body center, the cubic, Unit cell, okay? Uh, two atoms. Of course, you can calculate the volume of a single atom from the radius, from the radius, right? And you can calculate the overall volume of the atoms. You have two atoms, and you know the volume of a single atom from the radius, okay? And then you can calculate the volume of the unit cell from the edge length, from the edge length. If you divide the volume of the atoms, the real volume of the atoms by the volume of the cube, and you multiply this by 100, this gave you the backing, uh, 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 the backing percent. Or uh, uh, if you, 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 you divide the, the, the volume of the atoms by the volume of the unit cell, this will give you the backing fraction, the backing, the backing fraction. So we'll uh, test this for the body center of the cubic, this is a, the relationship is valid, and you can uh, review it in the last slides. So the backing fraction here is basically the volume of the sphere. The volume of the sphere, we have two atoms, and every single atom has the volume of four over three uh, pi r cubed. And you know r, you can calculate it very simply. You can, you, you can su substitute very simply here, uh, and you, you divide this by the volume of the unit cell, which is basically a cube. A cube, okay, and the A has the value of 4R over the square root of 3. So basically, you can 
uh, you can end up uh, with a backing fraction of 0 0.68. 0 0.68, if you want to calculate the percent, it is 68% backing fraction. This is for the structuring body center the cubic. Body center the cubic has a backing fraction of 68. 68. This is 68 percent. This is the backing fraction. And of course, if the backing fraction increases, so the 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 the, the, the structuring will be more compact. The structure will be more more compact, uh, compact, okay? So if you, if, if you calculate the backing ratio for face center cube, it is 70, which is the highest, 74.05%. Uh, for BCC is 68.02, and for simple cubic is 52. So which is more bagged, which is more bagged, the face center cube. Of course, in the periodic table, some elements, they crystallize in the face center of the cubic. Others are crystallizing in the body center cubic, and uh, others also are crystallizing in symbol in symbol cubic. So, backing fraction in uh, face center of the cubic, you can calculate it, of course, very simply uh, by knowing the number of atoms we have in the crystal lattice. We have four uh, in, in the single unit cell. We have four atoms. Uh, and of course, you can uh, separate it in two ways. If you want to calculate the volume of the atoms in the uh, on the uh, faces, uh, you can apply this uh, formula. We have six atoms, every one participate by one, and this is the volume of uh, one uh, one atom. Uh, and then you uh, calculate the, the volume of the eight atoms at the, 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 the corners. Uh, and of course, you, you need to uh, add both of them uh, together. This is the volume of the sphere. And after you calculate the volume of sphere, you substitute the backing fraction to end up with this uh, fraction, 0 0.74. This is the, the backing fraction for face center, for face center cubic. And uh, coming to here, we uh, finished the chapter of uh, solids. By the way, uh, in the midterm exam, uh, the solids will not be covered. Okay, so we will stop uh, at uh, liquids. Okay, states conversion. I will ask you a question. When you uh, hang your clothes after you wash them by water, you put them uh, to dry in air, right? Okay. So is it possible for water to uh, diffuse in the air at room temperature? To diffuse or to, uh, to convert to the gaseous phase for liquid water to, com to be converted to the gaseous phase at room temperature? Why? But, uh, but actually, when you hang your clothes while they are uh, wetted by water, after some time, you find them dried, right? So what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? This is a conversion from the liquid state to the gaseous state. Is it possible at room temperature? Okay, forget about this. If you have a cup of tea up into the air, Okay, and you left it to the next week. Do you think the volume will shrink next uh, uh, when you see it uh, the, the, the the week next? What happened? Vibration, uh, vaporization. This is vaporization. Is it possible for a liquid to vaporize at room temperature? Possible? But you said uh, no at the beginning, <laughs> right? So is it possible to uh, convert from the liquid to the gas at room temperature? So you need to uh, realize this and to uh, perfectly uh, recognize it, okay? So it's very simply, very simple. you see it every day. You see it every day, okay? So there's a big difference between vaporization or evaporation and the boiling. 
What's the difference? What's boiling? What is boiling? Is what? You hit something to the boiling. So what happened at the boiling? The, because you, you are confused. You, you, you said no, we, water will, will not vaporize at room temperature. Because you uh, misunderstand the difference between boiling and vaporization. You, you, you think that uh, uh, <laughs> vaporization can only happen when you reach to boiling, okay? You don't need to go to boiling to, uh, for your clothes. You, if, you, if this is the case, then you need to heat up the clothes in open air, and uh, if you find something uh, after that, you will be lucky, okay? Okay, so uh, what happens when you heat a liquid? When you heat a liquid, and even in open atmosphere, in open atmosphere, you provide heat, what heat can affect or can do for the liquid? Of course, you should appreciate and you should realize the law of energy conservation, right? So if you provide a heat, there should be a way for that heat to be absorbed by the liquid, right? Okay, so what happens when you, when you heat a liquid? When you heat a liquid, you overcome the intermolecular forces. You, 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 you break the intermolecular forces, right? You break some intermolecular forces. So when you break some intermolecular, so, so the heat is consumed in breaking, so the, the heat is conserved, the energy is conserved, right? So when you break the bonds, what happens next? How about the, 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 the motions? Do you think the motions will be enhanced or will be dec decreased the motions? What kind of motions in the, in, the, in the liquid, in the liquid state? What kind of motions? You remember we, we, we discussed three different types of motions, the translation and the rotation and the vibration, okay? So at home you can uh, put a cup of uh, any liquid to uh, heat in the microwave. You subject this to a uh, microwave and the microwave can uh, enhance the rotational vibration. The rotational vibration. When you, when you enhance the rotational vibration, the kinetic energy increase and you feel that in raising the temperature, in raising that you remember when I told you that the, 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 the temperature is an index for the motion, for the random motions, temperature is an index for the random motions. Okay, today the temperature is uh, 25. Okay, that in, reflects the, the motions of air particles in the atmosphere. Okay, but when temperature is zero Celsius, that also reflects the, 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 the motions of uh, air particles in the atmosphere. So the temperature is basically is basically an index for the random motions, for the kinetic energy of the particles, okay? So when you heat up the liquid, when you heat up the liquid, as I said, you break the bonds a little. You break the bonds, so the motion is enhanced. The motion increased, okay? Uh, whether the motion is uh, rotational or uh, vibrational or translational, all moods are enhanced by by providing heat. So the, the, the motions will as well change the temperature because the temperature prob the case of the motions, the case of the motion. Once the motions are enhanced, then the temperature will get will get up, will increase. Okay, so uh, basically, at room temperature, vaporization is possible. Okay, but when you heat the liquid up, the vaporization increase. Okay, you heat up more, the vaporization increase. Okay, you heat up more, the vaporization increase until you reach to uh, a point that uh, heating 
will uh, inspire a case which is different from all the other cases, uh, the previous cases, where uh, the, 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 the heating uh, or providing more uh, energy can convert completely the liquid to the gas phase. This is the boiling case, the boiling case. But actually, you know, when you heat up the, 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 the liquid at the beginning, you convert, you convert larger part from the liquid to the gas. And this gas is sustained or are located very close to the, the, the liquid. So it, exert, it exerts a vapor pressure on the surface of the liquid. Exert a vapor pressure. Okay, this uh, is uh, obviously seen if the, the container that contains the water is closed. It's closed. You heat up and the, the gas phase is confined in the, 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 the empty space. Okay, so uh, this gas particles can exert a pressure over, over the liquid surface. Okay, and as you continue, more gas particles exist, exist in, the, in that empty space, okay? And uh, by the way, uh, we have a rate of vaporization which is dependent on the temperature and we also, we have uh, a rate of condensation for the gas because the, the gas are located in the, in the uh, empty space but it exerts a pressure and is also moving around so at certain times, gas are trapped by the liquid again. So it converted from the gas phase to the liquid state. So eventually we end up to a case of equilibrium between the rate of condensation and the rate of vaporization, the rate of vaporization and the rate of condensation. And, and uh, when, when you reach to this uh, case, uh, we will call the vapor pressure as the equilibrium vapor pressure. Equilibrium vapor pressure, or uh, for simplicity, we will call it vapor pressure, vapor pressure. And this depends on the temperature, depends on the temperature. At every single temperature, we have a value for the vapor pressure for a certain, for a certain liquid, okay? So by heating, by uh, increasing the, the motions, uh, by increasing the, the, the temperature, the index, okay? So we will have a value for vapor pressure. So vapor pressure increases with temperature until you go to a certain point, like for the, the liquid water, when you reach 200 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, this is the new case. At that point, at that point, we will have a boiling, we will have a boil. The energy you provide, which is supposed to increase the kinetic energy, is engaged in another process, which is the other process, is the conversion from the liquid to to the gas, this is, so, so we will have two processes now at 100 degrees Celsius. We will have two processes. One, uh, the energy can, 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 can be used to increase the kinetic energy, to break bonds on like this. And the other one is to convert directly the, the liquid state, to the, the liquid state to the vapor state. Those are two competing processes, but thermodynamically, the conversion from the liquid to the, to the gas is thermodynamically favorable. So the temperature will stop rising at the boiling. You know, when you, uh, when you boil a kettle of water and you put the, the, the thermometer in the, that kettle and you start from the beginning, you will notice that the temperature will rise directly, rise as you provide energy, as you provide heat, the temperature will increase, okay? until you reach to the boiling and you will notice that the temperature is fixed at 100 degrees Celsius, is fixed until the whole amount of water are vaporizing, okay? How about if the whole amount of water are vaporizing and you still, where you still provide heat, you still provide heat, you will notice that the, the heat will next go to the kettle material or to the, the, uh, the, 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 the container that you are using and uh, it, it might melt the material, the, the solid material. And of course, some of you are subjected to this 
Okay, this is a simple heat transfer process. Again, when you heat the water, okay, at the beginning, the heat is going to the increasing the kinetic energy, and this appears in rising the level of the thermometer. Okay, you continue, you continue this until you go to the hundred uh, degrees Celsius. At that point, the rising of the temperature stop until you convert the whole material of the liquid to the solid because we have two competing processes at that point okay and once you convert the whole amount to the to the gas phase and you still provide heat okay so the temperature will rise again the temperature will rise again whatever the material that you have okay it can melt it can be melted okay so this is the, the whole story that uh, is talking about vaporization Vaporization is, is a process that converts the, 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 uh, is the conversion of the liquid to the gas phase. Is it possible to uh, vaporize the liquid at room temperature? Is it possible? Yes, possible. But the vaporization is enhanced at elevated temperature. At elevated temperature. What is the difference between vaporization and the boiling? This is uh, a process, and this is another one. This is another one, okay? So you, you now re realize the difference between them and you can appreciate the way that you can put the energy in, okay? And which one is preferred? If you have the choice for two processes, thermodynamics can tell you this one is favorable, this one is unfavorable right now, okay? So you need to appreciate the whole process. Where is the bin? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Okay. so this is vaporization, and this is what you do. At room temperature, you can, of course, dry your clothes, okay? Uh, and also, this is uh, for water vaporization from liquid that can happen very simply at room, at room temperature. So vaporization at any temperature, a certain number of molecules in a liquid has a sufficient kinetic energy to escape. Of course, you need to overcome the, the, the attraction forces of these liquids to go from the liquid state to the to the uh, to the uh, vapor state. Okay, and of course, the kinetic energy uh, the liquid can acquire from the atmosphere from the atmosphere. Okay, uh, evaporation is endothermic, of course, because you need to va to provide energy, even if the liquid will take will acquire this energy from the atmosphere. Still, the process is endo, endothermic, okay? When a liquid evaporates in a closed vessel, it will exert a vapor pressure on the surface of the, of the liquid. A vaporization process uh, and the concentration of the gas molecules increase uh, and their tendency to return back to condense uh, increase as well. The rate of, of evaporation is constant at a given temperature, okay? But uh, the rate of condensation depends on the concentration of the gas in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the container, in the closed container, okay? When the rate of evaporation equal to the rate of condensation, this is the state of a dynamic equilibrium, and the vapor pressure at that time is called the equilibrium vapor pressure, or basic, or simply the vapor, the vapor pressure, okay? So the equilibrium vibration is the maximum vibration a liquid exert at a given temperature, at a given temperature. This is very important the, 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 uh, to, uh, to know the, the relationship of the, the vibration uh, by, uh, with the temperature, okay? This is constant at a constant T. Uh, liquids with high vibration are said to be volatile. volatile. Uh, what, what, what volatile means? That it has uh, a large vibration at room at room temperature, like the methanol or the uh, organic solvents, okay, they have, uh, they, they are volatile. So basically in the figure you see that the rate of evaporation, the blue line is uh, constant at a given temperature, but uh, the rate of condensation increased. At the beginning it was zero before vaporization, but uh, with the vaporization, the rate of condensation increased until they become equal, the blue and the red lines here, and at that point, this is the equilibrium vapor pressure of the liquid at a given temperature, okay?
Of course, you can measure the equilibrium vapor pressure as we uh, we did in the the manometers, uh, the chapter of gases. Okay, so if you put uh, here uh, in a, a closed vessel like this with uh, a U-shaped uh, tube uh, filled with a mercury, uh, when you open the uh, tab here, uh, you can uh, estimate the the rising of the uh, mercury uh, level, and you, you can get information about the equilibrium vapor pressure. Okay, so uh, vapor pressure is uh, very uh, uh, closely uh, related to the intermolecular forces and the niche, uh, the nature of the intermolecular forces in the liquid. As the intermolecular forces increases, the vapor pressure will get lower, will get lower, and the boiling point will be higher. The boiling point will be higher. How about the boiling point? What is the boiling point? The boiling point is the temperature, is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid, as I said, when you heat up the liquid, the vapor pressure increase. So the boiling is point is assigned by the vapor pressure of the liquid, which is equal to the external pressure. External Pressure. And when the external pressure is one atmosphere, this is called the normal boiling point. The normal boiling point. So if the intermolecular forces is big, is large uh, in the liquid, uh, this indicates that you need to provide more heat. Okay? And you need to go to higher, to higher temperature to overcome the intermolecular forces in that liquid. And therefore, the boiling point will be will be large, will be large. Okay. So the vapor pressure is determined by the strength of the intermolecular forces. Strong intermolecular forces. This means that low equilibrium vapor pressure. Okay. Low equilibrium vapor pressure. This is the case of water. Water is boiling is very high compared to other liquids. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, because uh, the intermolecular forces in water is is massive, is unbelievable to this small molecule. To this small molecule. Okay, uh, if you remember the, the last lecture, uh, water arrange uh, themselves in a structure to have four hydrogen bonds for every single molecule of water. Four hydrogen bonds for every single molecule of water. The rate of evaporation uh, depends, of course, the rate of uh, depends on the, the, the heating or the temperature is, is basically depend on the temperature or in heating and also increased by increasing the surface area. As you go to uh, a larger boot like this, the surface is subjected is, uh, to the, the processes is uh, larger. And then the rate of evaporation will be will be higher. Uh, if you compare the vapor pressure uh, of three uh, liquids like the uh, diacyl ether and the acyl alcohol and the water, you will observe that the vapor pressure of all of them increases with temperature. But and also uh, you, you see that the, the one atmosphere here on the y-axis, one atmosphere. This is the pressure, the external pressure that we at, at the sea level, okay? When the vapor pressure of any liquid equal to one atmosphere, boiling start. Boiling start, okay? So for the diacyl ether, the boiling starts at something around uh, 36 degrees Celsius. But for acyl alcohol, it happens uh, a bit before 80. And for water, it happens at 100 degrees. So what do you expect? Which is expected to have the highest intermolecular forces? Which one of them? Water, of course. And next will be acyl alcohol. And the next will be diacyl. What kind of bonding you expect here for the diacyl ether? This is for the uh, midterm exam also. Okay. What kind of bonding you expect here for diacyl ether? The major type of bonding here in this one. Okay. The major type here may be the uh, dipole dipole attractions, the physical attractions, okay? Because oxygen is attached directly to carbon, so this is not a hydrogen bond, okay? 
But if you look to the acyl alcohol here, hydrogen bond is, is obvious, okay? Because oxygen is attached to hydrogen. How about the bond between oxygen and hydrogen in, in, in acyl alcohol? The bond between oxygen, oxygen, this oxygen, and the hydrogen. What kind of bonding here? Enter or intra? Enter or intra? Intra, because it is within the same molecule, within, not between two molecules. It is within the same molecule. So this is intramolecular forces. So this is covalent bond. This is covalent bond. Is it polar or non-polar? You should practice for this. Is it polar or non-polar? Polar, because we have a large difference in the electronegativity, okay? So how can I, I'm saying we have hydrogen bond. Where is the hydrogen bond here? Where is the hydrogen bond? The hydrogen bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen of another molecule. Between hydrogen and the oxygen of another molecule. This is intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bond is a physical bond. Hydrogen bond is a physical, not a chemical. The, the bond inside the molecule is chemical. The bond inside the molecule is chemical. I don't, I, I don't want you to, to get confused in the exam, okay? So you should differentiate between the chemical and the physical. Hydrogen bond is a physical bond. A, any bond inside the molecule is chemical, either covalent or ionic or metallic, okay? But you should not uh, say that this is uh, hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond ca ca can, of course, exist in a single molecule, but also in physical nature. In physical nature, of if oxygen in a, a given group is attracted to the hydrogen of another group in the same molecule, but physically also, not physically, not not chemically, not not chemically. Okay. So uh, these are three different molecules. And we uh, appreciate the, the, the large difference in the vapor pressure of uh, water and acyl alcohol and diacyl ether. But this is actually not the normal case. Actually, uh, uh, on a regular basis, usually when the, 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 the molar mass or the, uh, of the molecule or the molecule is get larger, then we expect more attraction forces uh, or stronger attraction forces, so you expect that the boiling is higher. This is uh, the rule, but the exceptions here is because of the number of hydrogen bonds that water uh, can uh, participate in, uh, so this is an exception for the rule. Uh, water has a molar mass of 18, and uh, dimethyl ether has uh, uh, a molar mass of 46, but actually, the boiling point of water is much, much higher. This, uh, this is an exception for the rule. But uh, if I compare between two hydrocarbons, one has a, 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 a small uh, molar mass, uh, and the other one has a large molar mass, I, I should expect that for the high molar mass, uh, the, the, the higher attractions, higher uh, forces, uh, more boiling point is expected. This is uh, the, the rule, okay? But the case here for water is an exception, okay? Uh, the molar heat of vaporization, molar heat of vaporization, if you have an amount of water and you want to vaporize them uh, completely, the amount of heat required for this vaporization is called uh, the heat of vaporization. How about the molar heat of vaporization? This is the amount of energy uh, required to vaporize one mole of a liquid. Required to vaporize one mole of a liquid. Uh, of course, as the strength of the forces increase, the vapor pressure decreases and the delta H as well increases. Uh, how about the specific or the latent heat of vaporization? Uh, this is the amount of heat required to vaporize one gram. The other one was for one mole, but this one is for one, one gram. So what is the relationship between the molar and specific heat of vaporization? The molar heat of vaporization equal to the specific heat of vaporization times the molar mass times the, the if, so if if you have if if you know any one of them you can you can get the other one uh, by knowing the molar mass uh, and the molar mass of uh, molar heat of 
Fusion is the amount of heat required to uh, melt uh, one mole of a solid, and the specific heat of fusion is the amount of heat also required to melt one gram of the solid, and the same relationship apply between them uh, as we discussed in the last slide. The boiling point, I, I define the boiling point as the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid equals the external, and if the external pressure is uh, one at atmosphere, the point is uh, termed as normal boiling uh, point. As the strength of an intermolecular force increase, you should uh, remember this, okay? Uh, as the intermolecular force increase, delta H uh, of vaporization increase, and the boiling point increase. How about the, the melting point or the freezing point? This is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid equal to the vapor pressure of the solid. So uh, you may attain to the point that the, the, the vapor pressure of the solid equal to the vapor pressure of the liquid. Uh, Clausius-Cleaborn equation, uh, this equation gives the relationship between the vapor pressure and the temperature. What kind of relationship between the pressure and, and temperature? Is it uh, a direct relationship or an uh, inverse relationship? Is it inverse or direct? Uh, but as I said, as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increase. Okay? So how about you, uh, how can you understand this? The existence of the negative sign here uh, flip the relationship from the, the, the opposite to the direct. Okay? So the relationship between the vapor pressure and temperature is a direct relationship. Okay? As the temperature increases, the vapor pressure the vapor pressure increase. R here is the uh, universal gas constant, but you should use it in 8.314 Joule per Kelvin mole. Okay? So you can arrange, of course, the equation, or you can even plot lem B against 1 over T to get uh, a straight line with a negative slope like this, and the slope equal to minus delta H over, over R. Okay? And the intercept, of course, is equal to 2C. Uh, or you can... Uh, both the relationship in this format to compare the vapor pressure of two different temperatures, like this, lem B1 over B2 equal to delta V over R times one over T2 minus one over T1, okay? So uh, any change in this equation uh, will make all the calculations wrong, okay? So you do not uh, get confused for the minus sign here or, uh, or you may take the minus sign outside here and you flip the two sides uh, or you change the, the, the two sides together. You need to realize the equation uh, as it is written here in the board. The, the vapor pressure is directly proportional to T1. B1 is directly proportional to T1. And the B2 here is directly proportional to T2. You should... Realize this relation. Okay? So exercise, the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.8 torr. And the heat of vaporization is 43.9. Calculate the vapor pressure of water at 50 degrees Celsius. At 50 degrees, you expect the vapor pressure will be higher because at 25, it was 23.8. So you expect at higher temperatures, the vapor pressure will be, will be higher. So you apply in the equation here, and you calculate everything is known, but uh, you should uh, consider or you should pay attention to the unit of the uh, heat of vaporization. It gives you the heat of vaporization in kilojoule per mole. So you need to convert from kilojoule to joule, okay? Uh, so, pay attention for the unit convergence, okay? And finally, you calculate the pressure to be 93.7. So, uh, yes, this is true. The vapor pressure increased with increasing the, the temperature, okay? This is called the, the, the heating curve, the heating curve. If you start with... Uh, 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 amount of water uh, at uh, minus 20 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, 
this is uh, supposed to be in the ice face in the ice in the ice face and you started heating this piece of ice so as i said the heat will be consumed to increase the kinetic energy and that will be reflected in rising the temperature right so the, this is what happened here from minus 20 when you go up in this line here the, the kinetic energy increase and the temperature increase until you go to the zero slesius. Once you go to the zero slesius, we have another process here, which is the melting, which is the melting. So we have a competition now between increasing the kinetic energy and the, the transformation, the state transformation. So thermodynamically, the state transformation is more favorable. So all the energy you provide will go to convert the ice to liquid water. So you will observe that the temperature will be, will stay constant here until you convert the whole amount of ice to, to liquid water. Once you, you finish the conversion, while you still provide heat, you still provide heat, so the heat will be consumed to increase the kinetic energy of the liquid water. And you will observe that the temperature will, will rise again to go in the very long line here, the very long line here. And basically, the length of that line uh, is a feature for specific liquid, for specific liquid. Because water is uh, a miracle, as I said, a miracle molecule, okay? So you need to go to very high temperature to boil the water. So it consumes a large amount of energy to convert from the, the, the liquid state to the, to, the vapor, to the vapor state, okay? So the kinetic energy will increase in that line. This is the, for the liquid water until we reach to one atmosphere, to one uh, atmosphere uh, or uh, to, to, to uh, we, we are at one atmosphere until we reach 200 degrees Celsius until we reach and at 100 degrees Celsius we have another process starting now which is the vaporization or the boiling the boiling the, not the vaporization is the boiling the conversion from the liquid state to the gaseous state so the temperature stop rising until we convert the whole amount of liquid water to the gaseous phase. Once we finish the conversion and you still provide heat, the heat will be consumed to increase the kinetic energy of the gaseous molecule, of the gaseous molecule. This is called the, 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 the heating curve, the heating curve. And the opposite of this uh, line is called the uh, cooling, uh, uh, Cooling curve, cooling curve. So you, you, you go from uh, very low temperature here to high temperature. This is called heating. And the, if you cool down from the high temperature to the low temperature, this will be called the cooling curve, okay? Uh, and the same processes will, will, will happen, both in cooling and in, in heating, okay? Uh, the energy consumed here to uh, melt the ice is actually the latent heat of fusion, latent heat of fusion. So this is the energy required to melt, to melt the ice. This is called the latent heat of fusion. And the other one here is called the latent heat of vaporization, delta HV. But you notice here that delta HV is larger than delta HF. Can you imagine why? Why delta HV? is uh, uh, larger than delta HF while we are talking about the same amount of water, same amount of water. But delta H of vaporization is, is much, much higher, okay? This is much, much higher because uh, to vaporize the liquid, you need to break all the kinds of intermolecular forces, okay? Uh, to uh, uh, and to make the atoms are disconnected completely, okay? So it requires uh, a much higher energy to uh, to attain or to uh, inspire the high degree of freedom for the atoms, for the atoms. 
So delta HV is usually very large compared to delta delta HF. Okay. All these change, of course, are physical change, not chemical change, because we are breaking intermolecular forces. Okay. Uh, so uh, describe here that the melting at the melting point the market become energetic enough to uh, overcome the lattice energy. The energy is used to overcome the lattice energy and break the bonds. The temperature remain constant as the solid is completely changed to liquid. Okay, vapor pressure of solid. How can we understand the equilibrium? This equilibrium uh, for the the, the uh, vaporization in the melting and the uh, and in the uh, vaporization. Let me go back to the the heating curve again. Okay, so. Uh, when you go from minus 20 degrees Celsius to zero, at that line, at that line, how many phases exist for water at that line? At that line, how many phases exist? We have ice, right? Do we have liquid water? No, we don't have liquid water, right? Do we have gas, liquid water vapor? No, we have only Ice. So how many phases exist at that line? Only one. Only one. Okay. The other line here for liquid water. For liquid water. How many phases we have? Only we have liquid water. Okay. How many lines? How many phases we have for the steam? The last one here. Also one phase, which is the steam. Okay. But how many phases exist here? For the vertical lines, two faces we have, two faces. Here we have ice and water, and over there we have water and steam. So we have equilibrium here between two faces. These are equilibriums, and that's why we are using here delta HF, and here also we have delta HF, because this is a reversible process. This is a reversal. We have two faces existing in equilibrium. We have two faces existing uh, at equilibrium, okay? So we will understand this in the curves here to understand the equilibrium, okay? Uh, as a relationship for the pressure and temperature. Look at the, the dark blue line here, dark blue line here. It gives, uh, after zero degrees Celsius, after zero degrees Celsius, the dark blue line here represents the increase of the vapor pressure with temperature. This is very normal. The, yeah, and you can get it from uh, measurements. Yeah, you increase the temperature and you, you for liquid water, for liquid, and you, you and you estimate the vapor pressure. Okay, but before zero degrees Celsius, look at the rose line here. This is for solid. This is for solid. It also represents the vapor pressure the change of the vapor pressure with temperature. Okay. How about the other two lines for liquid water before zero? For liquid water before zero. This is, uh, it looks like extrapolation for the other line here, but before, this is a hypothetical case, of course, hypothetical because uh, below zero, uh, liquid water will not exist at one atmosphere, right? But uh, you, can, you, can, you can estimate the values even for supercooling water you can get the vapor pressure like this. And for solids, you can extrapolate this line after zero, even if it, if it is a hypothetical case, a hypothetical case, to continue like this. Uh, the feature that you observe here, that you observe here, that the slope of the solid line, the slope of the solid line is steeper than the slope of the blue line, right? Right? So the solid is... Uh, is affected largely by the increase in, in the temperature more even than the liquid, more even than the liquid. If you increase both of them five degrees Celsius, the, the solid will be affected largely. Then the, the, this is indicated from the slope of the line. The slope of the, 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 slope of the solid line is, is steeper, okay? And also you can appreciate this if you change the temperature from zero to uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius, 
you will find the difference in the vapor pressure of the solid from this point to uh, the, the orange point here is larger than from the orange to the liquid state. The difference is larger for, for the solid state, right? The same apply for uh, even after uh, uh, after uh, uh, or uh, at temperature higher than zero. At, for example, plus four, plus four. You look here, the difference is larger. Even if you increase the temperature with the same uh, amount, same degree, four degree for both of them, but the change in the solid is is larger because the slope is is larger. So be, below zero degrees Celsius, below zero degrees Celsius, the pressure, the vapor pressure of ice is lower than the vapor pressure of of water. Before zero, uh, below zero Celsius, the, the vapor pressure of ice is lower than the, the vapor pressure of uh, liquid. And the opposite is, is true for uh, the case after zero degrees Celsius. The, the, the vapor pressure of the solid will be higher than the vapor pressure of, of the liquid. We will use these two, uh, two features uh, to understand the, the convergence of state, the conversion of state. So you should realize that before zero degrees Celsius, before the zero degrees Celsius, which will be, uh, which will have the higher vapor pressure, the liquid or the solid, the higher vapor pressure before zero Celsius, which will have the, the, the higher vapor pressure from these lines, the liquid will have the, the higher vapor pressure. And the after zero degrees Celsius, which will have the, uh, the, the higher vapor pressure, the solid will have the higher, the higher vapor pressure, the higher vapor pressure, okay? So, uh, B ice has a larger temperature dependence than uh, B liquid. B ice increases more rapidly for a given rise in temperature than B liquid, okay? At temperature higher than zero degrees Celsius, as I said, the, the vapor pressure of the solid will be higher than the vapor pressure of of, of the liquid. So if you have these two bottles, what is that? Okay, if you have these two bottles connected together uh, like this, in, in, in one bottle here we have uh, solid water and the other one uh, has a liquid water. And we assume that we are at uh, a, a high temperature, high uh, temperature than zero degrees Celsius. As I said, the B ice will be higher than the B liquid at that point. What does that, uh, what does that mean, or what, what will uh, affect the, the the process here? That the vapor pressure of the solid will be higher. So we have higher amount of water gas here, water gas, water vapor here. And once you connect the, both tubes together, this amount of gas will come here. But actually. At the beginning, there was a, an equilibrium between the, the, the rate of vaporization and rate of condensation uh, inside uh, 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 this tube for the liquid. When vapors come from the solid state, it increases the rate of condensation. It increases the rate of condensation in the liquid, so the vapor gas converts to the liquid. So eventually, you, you feel that the solid is converted to liquid, and this is the the the, uh, the regular process that you should observe after zero degrees Celsius. After zero degrees Celsius, solid will melt to liquid water. So that explains the whole process. The vapor pressure of solid is higher. More amounts of uh, water gas will come here to the other tube, and they will condense because the vapor pressure of the solid is higher than the vapor pressure of the liquid. How about uh, at uh, lower uh, at temperature lower than zero degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of the liquid will be higher than the solid. So the, the opposite will will be true here. Okay, these are the two flasks here, but the vapor pressure of liquid is higher. So eventually gases will go to the other side and the condense in the liquid state. So it will end up to this state that all the water will be converted to the solid state. How about if we are at zero degrees Celsius? At zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of liquid equal to the vapor pressure of, 
of ice <coughs> and hence we will reach to this equilibrium okay because the vapor pressure of both of them are are equal okay okay so this is a sort of uh, phase diagram uh, that we will uh, consider for water phase diagram. Did you hear about phase diagram before? Phase diagram is actually a simple representation for the different phases of a substance as a function of temperature and depression. Okay, so uh, it represents the different states of a given material. I think we will talk about the, the one component system. One component system. Uh, like uh, water or carbon dioxide, okay? So we'll explain the whole states of material at different temperature and different pressures, okay? So this is the phase diagram of water. For example, it has uh, three different areas like wh uh, what you see here for the solid, for the liquid, for the vapor, and the prosthesis involved in the conversion between all of them, okay? This is as a function of temperature, and as a function of pressure, okay? So from this uh, diagram, you can very easily go uh, to check uh, the state of uh, water at a specific temperature and a specific, specific uh, pressure, okay? Uh, okay, uh, all these lines here in the diagram, the black lines here, uh, this is the line of the conversion. Uh, like this uh, line between the solid and the liquid, this is called the melting line. It's called the melting line. And the other line here, uh, the black one between the liquid and the vapor, this is called the vaporization line or the boiling line. Vaporization, uh, the, the boiling line, the boiling, the boiling line, okay? And this line here, down here between the solid and the vapor, this is called the sublimation line because uh, it involves the direct conversion from the solid to the, to the gas directly without passing by the, uh, the liquid state. How about the, the red point here? The red point is called the travel point. And this is a very uh, 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 featured point for every material. This is called the travel point. The travel point is uh, the, 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 the temperature and the pressure at which the three phases of the material exist in equilibrium, exist in, in equilibrium, okay? Okay, so if I stop here at any given point in the solid state, and I ask you, how many phases exist at this point? How many phases? Only one single phase, which is the solid, right? Here, inside here, at any given temperature and pressure inside this uh, area, uh, this is supposed to be solid. So it is only one phase. How about in the liquid, only one phase. In the vapor, only one phase. How about, about on the, the, the melting line, on the line itself? How many phases we have? Two phases, solid and, and the liquid, okay? Okay, so actually this line, which is the melting line, is basically several or multiple melting points at different pressures, okay, at different pressures. So it represents the melting points of uh, water at uh, several, several uh, pressure value. As I said, if you are in the, the one atmosphere, then the, 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 the boiling point will be, will be zero, will be the melting point, the melting point will be, will be zero. The same apply for the, the boiling line. For the boiling line, it represents also multiple boiling points at uh, several uh, uh, atmospheric or several several external external pressure. And if you are at one atmosphere, then at one atmosphere, look at here. At one atmosphere, then the boiling point will equal to to one uh, to hundred to hundred degree degrees Celsius. Okay. So this is the structure of the, uh, the, 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 the phase diagram of water. How about the critical point here, the, the last one here? Uh, we will come to the definition of the critical point. This is actually the point uh, beyond which 
uh, water vapor cannot be liquefied, cannot be liquefied, and we'll start talking about a fourth state of the material, which is called superfluids, superfluids. Beyond this, beyond this point, we will talk about superfluids, a state uh, where you cannot distinguish the liquid and the, 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 the vapor. You cannot distinguish it, and the material will have properties in between, between liquids and between, between uh, the gas, okay? Uh, and uh, actually, right now, uh, we have uh, a fashion for sober uh, critical uh, liquids, for sober critical liquids, okay? And we'll see this in next slide, okay? So the phase diagram, Describe the conditions and events in a closed system where no material can escape into the surrounding and no air is present. Exercise. How can you reach the vapor state from point F? Where is point F? This is point F. How can you go from the liquid state to the vapor state? How can you go? Of course, you, you can go this way where you increase the temperature while fixing the pressure. So you can convert from here to here. Of course, you can do the opposite. You can fix the temperature, but you lower the pressure. You lower the pressure. So you can also convert from the liquid to the gas. Or even you can decrease, uh, increase, both, uh, increase the, the temperature and decrease the, the pressure. So you can go this way. So any way you can reach uh, to the gaseous phase by uh, changing the pressure and the temperature, okay? Uh, sublimation, uh, it occurs at the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the ice equal to the external pressure. Uh, if the vapor pressure of the ice, ice, so you heat up the ice, maybe at very low pressure. If you heat the ice, the vapor pressure will, uh, if, if the vapor pressure of the ice uh, become equal to the external pressure, then the sublimation occurs directly, okay? So this is the sublimation. So imagine if you have uh, water in a closed vessel like this one, and this is a, a cylinder, it has a movable uh, piston, and you want to uh, apply uh, different pressures uh, on that uh, uh, cylinder, okay? You have a fixed amount of water inside here, and you want to apply pressure from the outside. Uh, it's said no bubbles can form within the liquid as long as the vapor pressure is less than one atmosphere. As long as you subject the whole container to one atmosphere, so boiling will not uh, attain until uh, the vapor pressure of the liquid become equal to one atmosphere. If it becomes equal to one atmosphere, then boiling will, will start, okay? So we'll consider the case one, number one. This is, uh, we have initially water at minus 20 degrees Celsius, as we mentioned uh, over there in the heating curve, okay? So we have uh, experiment number one, exper water at minus 20 degrees Celsius, and we are at one atmosphere. We are, and imagine what will happen. If you heat up the cylinder, the previous cylinder, okay, uh, at one atmosphere, first of all, you will increase, as I say, you will increase the kinetic energy of the particles, okay, until you reach to the state of melting. So you will see, you will observe the melting here. The whole amount of the ice will be converted to liquid, okay? And then you increase the temperature, so you observe the increase in the kinetic energy, which will be reflected in the rise of the temperature, okay? So the temperature will be uh, rise again here until you reach to uh, 100 degrees Celsius, and at 100 degrees Celsius here, water will be boiled. Water will be boiled, and if you continue more than this, then the temperature also will get rise here uh, in the vapor, in the vapor state. So this is experiment. Number one, experiment number one, uh, the temperature here uh, of melting is zero degrees Celsius, and the temperature here is 100 degree, 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. How about if you repeat the, the same experiment but at two torr? 
to tor is 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 uh, is much much lower than uh, one atmosphere. Okay, because one atmosphere is, is uh, 760 tor, but now we are at two tor. If you repeat the same experiment, the ice will not be converted to liquid, but will be converted to gas, to gas directly. So this is the sublimation. This is the sublimation. Look at experiment number three. If you are at a pressure of 4.58 torr, okay? And you are here at minus 20 Celsius, degrees Celsius, and you heat up at that pressure, so obviously you will reach to the treble point. And at the treble point, you will observe the three states of the material existing in equilibrium, existing in equilibrium. So you will go directly to the treble point, and if you increase, if you still provide heat, the temperature will increase, then you will convert this to the gases state, okay? So how about experiment number four? Experiment number four, if you put the water here at 374 degrees Celsius and at 218 atmosphere, you will observe a different case here because the, 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 the critical point of uh, water uh, is 300, a critical temperature is 374 degrees Celsius and the critical pressure is 218, okay? So if you, if you are at this point right now, the cross, the orange cross here, which is located at 300 degrees Celsius and 225 degree, to, 20, to, uh, 225 atmosphere here, and you want to, uh, to heat up the sample, once you, you increase the temperature and you reach to 374, this is the critical temperature. Above this critical temperature, if you increase more than 374, then you will reach to the state which is irreversible. The gas or the vapor will not be cooled, will not be cooled to a liquid state. Liquefaction is, will be stopped at this point, beyond this point, Liquefaction is impossible. Wherever uh, the, the, the amount of pressure you apply, so uh, basically, when you, uh, if you are uh, somewhere here in the, in the gas phase here, uh, at any given temperature, if you increase the pressure, you can convert the gas to the liquid. But beyond the critical temperature, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. So the critical point is a, a specific point for every phase diagram. Okay. And we will have some definitions here for the uh, critical point, okay? Uh, as I said, uh, beyond this critical point, the, the, the state uh, will not be a liquid, will not be a gas, but will be sober critical liquid, sober critical. This is, uh, can be considered as a fourth state of, of matter, okay? So experiment one, as I said, we fix the, the pressure at one atmosphere, and we started uh, heating up the ice, which was at uh, minus 20 degrees Celsius. The vapor pressure of ice is less than one atmosphere. The cylinder is heated, and uh, the, the, the whole process, as I mentioned uh, on the diagram, the vapor pressure of the solid and liquid are equal, but less than one atmosphere. This is true on the solid liquid line everywhere, except at the treble point. Heating continue after complete conversion to uh, go to boiling at uh, one atmosphere. And the second experiment, we changed the pressure to uh, two tor, so uh, we, 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 we moved directly to a sublimation. And for experiment three, the pressure was <coughs> suitable for uh, passing by the uh, treble points, so the three phases existed at equilibrium at the treble point. And for experiment four, uh, we reach it to a state of uh, super uh, cooled uh, liquids, and this occurred at the critical point, and the definition of critical temperature is the temperature above which the vapor cannot be liquefied no matter what pressure is applied, and the critical pressure is the pressure required to uh, produce liquefaction at the critical temperature. So at, at the critical temperature, 
can you make a liquefaction? Yes, you can make at the critical temperature. But beyond the critical temperature, you cannot make liquefaction. Beyond, okay? But at the critical, you can make the liquefaction. What is the pressure required to make the liquefaction at the critical temperature? Is the critical pressure. Is the critical pressure, okay? So supercritical fluids are substances at temperature and the pressures above their critical points where this liquid and the gas phases do not exist, okay? They have properties of gases and the liquid. They fuse uh, through solids like gas and dissolve material like a liquid. They are suitable for uh, as uh, organic solvents, uh, and they are participated in a range of industrial uh, procedures. This is the phase diagram of carbon dioxide, and you can observe here the state of the supercritical fluid. So if you want to prepare supercritical uh, uh, fluid of carbon dioxide, you need to go uh, a little further than the critical point, which can be attained at, uh, say, uh, 200 bar, 200 bar, and uh, maybe uh, 100 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius. You can, you can reach to the critical, uh, sober, uh, to the sober critical fluid of carbon, of carbon dioxide. And of course, the properties is unique for uh, this uh, super critical fluid. I'm coming to here, we uh, finish uh, this uh, chapter, uh, and inshallah, uh, we will start uh, talking about a new chapter uh, right in the week after, after the midterm uh, exam. Thank you very much for your attention.